We're going to continue our ecology unit and we are going to start lesson number four which is called predator-prey relationships. You're going to need your note taker that looks like this. It's a one page note taker so it should be easy to fill out. All right let's get started. So let's start by reviewing these concepts first and these are on um, Part of your standards and essential understandings. So organisms would have the capacity to produce populations of great size were it not for the fact that environments and resources are finite. This fundamental tension affects the abundance number of individuals of species in, every, in any given ecosystem. So this is pretty much saying that if it weren't for the uh, limited resources and the finite resources then populations would just grow out of control. Okay. Uh, the next concept is group behavior has evolved because membership can increase the chances of survival for individuals and their genetic relatives. So this just means that you're safer if you're part of a pack, if you're part of a group. That increases your chances of survival. And any population of organism grows um, it is held in check by interactions among a variety of biotic and abiotic factors. So we talked a little bit about um, the, the limiting factors in the last lesson and how these limiting factors can affect um, how a population grows. And it can affect um, that a population, it can limit the size of the population, sorry. So let's start with a couple of definitions and make sure you write those definitions down in your note taker. So the first definition is the definition of, uh, of a predator. And this is an organism that kills and eats another organism. So of course the predator in this picture would be the cheetah. And they are adapted and often highly specialized for hunting with acute senses such as vision, hearing, or smell. And then the prey, the gazelle, is the organism which the predator eats. So let's look at predator-prey populations and let's look at this graph. And while we explore this graph, see if you can answer these two questions um, in your note taker. So the first question is, how does predator-prey relationships keep population growths in control? So what do you see happening here? So here we see um, the rabbit population is going up and down, up and down, up and down. So um, it is fluctuating around its carrying capacity at a steady state. And then we see the same thing with the fox population, right? It's also going up and down, up and down, up and down. Now the first thing that you might notice here is that the prey population is a lot larger than the predator population. So there is usually more preys out there than predators. Okay? So as the prey numbers go up, right? what do you see happening to the predator numbers? Well, they go up too, right? So there's a lot of food to eat, so the predator number goes up. So what happens or what triggers the prey population to start going down? Well, probably that there's too many predators out there, right? So there's a lot of predators and they feed on a lot of prey. So that causes the prey numbers to go down. Okay, so notice how they're controlling each other. See, as the prey population goes up, so does the predator population. Right? Now there's a lot of prey, but there's also a lot of predators. So that means that these predators are going to eat a lot of prey, which means that the prey number starts to go down. And as the prey number starts to go down, what happens to the predator number? It also starts to go down. Right. So these populations are controlling each other in a good way. Right? You don't want this prey to grow out of control. And you don't want this predator number to grow out of control. So these predator-prey populations and interactions are actually good interactions. We need them as part of a healthy ecosystem. So 
So then to answer the next question, will the rabbit and fox populations grow logistically or exponentially? So do you see um, a J curve here? Well, initially, right? But then what's going to happen? They're going to fluctuate around their steady state and then they're gonna drop and then they're gonna go back up. So we see a logistic balanced growth okay? because they are just not growing exponentially out of control. There is a control of their growth, uh, both their growth. So both populations are growing logistically. So here we have another example of a predator-prey relationship, the wolves and the moose population. So here, as you explore this graph, um, you see the same thing is happening, right? So here we see the moose population. It starts to go up. And then because there's a lot of moose, meaning there's a lot of food for the wolves, we also see the wolf population start to go up, right? But now there's too many wolves out there preying on the moose, which means that the moose population is going to start to decrease. And now there's very little food for the wolves, and you see the wolf population starting to go down, right? And then it's a cycle that repeats itself um, throughout the years. All right, moving on. So let's explore the term keystone species. And let's um, try to figure out here, why is the otter a keystone species? So the definition of a keystone species that you're gonna need to write down in your note taker is that it's a species that has an unusually large effect on its ecosystem. So let's see what's happening here. Let's look at this food chain. Oops, let's look at this food chain here before the killer whale um, was introduced. So here you see um, the sea otter abundance, which is at about um, 100%, okay? Around this time, you see that the sea urchin abundance, um, it's around, you know, somewhere around what you, 50 grams per um, meter square. And you see the um, kelp density also is, is pretty high, right? Around 10 per 0.25 meters squared. So what happens when you introduce the killer whale into this ecosystem? So as you introduce the killer whale, what happens to the otter population? The otter population starts to go down. Notice that it's decreasing, right? As you decrease the otter population, what happens to the sea urchin biomass? Well, that starts to go up. And then what happens to the kelp density? So kelp is um, an aquatic plant that grows in um, the bottom of ocean floors. So you see that the kelp is um, um, decreasing. Actually, kelp is not a plant, it's an algae, if you want to be more specific. But anyways, the kelp population is decreasing. Okay. So what did the killer whale introduction do to this ecosystem? Do you think it had an effect um, when this killer whale was introduced? So um, let's look at this delicate balance. So over the last 20 years, killer whales have been preying on sea otters in Alaska as the whale's usual prey has declined. The decline of sea otters as a keystone species has allowed sea urchin populations to increase, resulting in the destruction of kelp forests. So here are the sea otters, pretty cute, right? Um, the sea otters are a keystone species. And what they do is they hold this ecosystem in the North Pacific um, intact and in place. That keystone species here, it's a very important piece of the ecosystem that if it's missing, if it's absent, the ecosystem kind of collapse. So this keystone species, the sea otter, it feeds on the sea urchins, right? and the sea urchins feed on the kelp. So you want to have a healthy amount of kelp in the ocean floors, right? Because they provide a habitat for other organisms. But what happens if the sea otter is absent? 
then you're going to have an explosion of sea urchin populations and they're going to overgraze the kelp and it's going to destroy this habitat. So the sea otter is a very important species known as a keystone species and you want them to be there. But we just learned that um, as the killer whales are being introduced into these ecosystems, they are feeding on the sea otters and killing them, which means that the sea urchin biomass increases, which means that there's overgrazing of kelp. So this killer whale introduction is not a good thing, right? Um, because you are destroying that keystone species that is actually needed. So who is introducing killer whales into um, areas in Alaska where they shouldn't be um, going? Well, of course, it's humans, right? So as humans um, destroy the um, habitat of whales and because of um, humans preying on whales and destroying the, the, the food and prey of whales, these killer whales have had to move into areas where there are sea otters. And then um, these killer whales are now destroying the sea otters and, and ruining this delicate ecosystem. So um, besides um, how humans have affected uh, the, the keystone species um, known as the otters in the um, Alaskan ecosystem, how else have humans interfered with other keystone species? So how does this picture make you feel? What do you see here? Hmm. You see wolves, right? Um, you see dead wolves as they were being hunted by, by humans. So a little background on this picture. Um, in the 1800s, westward is Expansion brought settlers and their livestock into direct contact with native predators and prey species. Much of the wolves' prey base was destroyed as agriculture flourished. With the prey base removed, wolves began to prey on domestic stock, which resulted in humans eliminating wolves from most of their historical range. Predator control, including poisoning, was practiced in Yellowstone National Park in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Other predators such as bears, cougars, and coyotes were also killed to protect livestock and more desirable wildlife species such as deer and elk. So this was an era before people, including many biologists, understood the concepts of ecosystems and the interconnectedness of species. At the time, the wolves' habitat of killing prey species was considered wanton destruction of the animals. So um, here in this picture, we see that um, in a time where it was actually encouraged for people to hunt these wolves in um, Yellowstone National Park. Because um, as you just heard, these wolves were preying on the domestic livestock of farmers. And, of course, that was not a good thing for the farmers, right? Um, the reason why the wolves had to go and prey on the domestic livestock of farmers is because humans pretty much um, settled and came into direct contact with the habitat of these wolves and the natural prey of these wolves. So these wolves had no other place to go, right? And they had no other prey to feed on other than the domestic stock of, um, of humans. So if you want to learn a little bit more about um, the Yellowstone Restoration Project, um, you can click on this link and this will tell you, well, what did we do, right? Or what happened? So we, we destroyed, pretty much decimated the wolf population in Yellowstone National Park. So what was done to, to restore the wolf population? And what do you think happened to the deer and elk population and the ecosystem of Yellowstone Park when the wolves were removed? So here is, is a picture of the before and after wolves. And um, this is a perfect example of how wolves are also an example of a keystone species. 
So in your note taker, you're supposed to give two examples of keystone species. So we've seen how the sea otters are a keystone species and now how the wolves are a keystone species. So notice what happened um, to uh, the Yellowstone National Park when there was a 70 year absence of the wolves as a top predator. So um, the elk over browsed the streamside willows. Uh, they pretty much um, uh, destroyed the, the aspen, tree, aspen trees. Um, they, the trees were seldom able to reach full height as the elk ate nearly all of the new sprouts. Um, because there was a, a loss of trees, then that means that um, other habitats were also destroyed. Um, side willows, cottonwoods, and shrubs that prevent erosion, which meant, meant that birds lost their nesting space. That also meant that habitat for fish and other aquatic species declined as waters became broader and shallower and without shade for streamside vegetation, they also warmer. And the coyote numbers climbed. Um, though they often kill elk calves, they prey mainly on small mammals like ground squirrels and uh, voles, reducing the food available for foxes, badgers, and raptors. So as you can see from this picture, Without the keystone species, without the um, wolves, the Yellowstone National Park ecosystem was on the verge of collapsing. So um, there, like I said, make sure you, you click on this link to learn about the restoration project. Um, but wolves were re re reintroduced into the Yellowstone National Park. And when they were reintroduced, we saw what happened to the ecosystem from 1995 to present. So the elk population was halved. And that's a good thing, right? Because the wolves were able to prey on the elk population. So that balanced predator-prey relationship was restored. Um, and as the elk population um, was halved, we'd see that the aspen trees started to sprout again. Uh, we start to see new groves in some areas. Uh, the coyote uh, population was also reduced um, because of wolf predation. And then we saw willows, cottonwoods, and other riparian vegetation have begun to stabilize stream banks, helping restore natural water flow. Um, overhanging branch branches again shade the water and welcome birds. Um, beavers were back because now they had enough vegetation to um, build their dams. Um, beaver colonies, um, uh, it says here that were um, they were able to um, now rise and you know because of their lush vegetation. And now with the beaver dams, they were able to create ponds and marshes supporting fish, amphibians, birds, small mammals, and rich insects populations to feed them. And, um, and, and another thing that happened here is as wolves don't cover their kill, so they boosted the food supply for scavengers, notably bald and golden eagles, coyotes, ravens, magpies, and bears. So um, we see that the wolves are a necessity in um, an ecosystem, right? And every species has its place. And predator-prey interactions are also very important um, as long as, uh, 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 as well as keystone species to keep an ecosystem healthy and stable. All right, so that's it for today. I hope you um, finished taking all your notes. And I hope you have a great day.